Let's worship everybody.
Good morning. Um, I wanted to take a few minutes to um, share what's happened in our lives over the past week, and I wish it was a, a it's a great story, but it's a, got some downfalls. Um, go ahead and put the first picture up for me. Um, last Sunday morning, I got a call from Colleen about 7.39 in the morning, and um, she had just gotten her driver's license last Thursday, and she um, called me to tell me she went into a ditch. Um, this is not really a ditch. <laughs> Just letting you guys know that. This is um, an inlet for the river. Um, and um, so I got dressed, I got out, and I, I went and, and met her at the scene. And I, I just stood there and said, how did you get out of this car? How, how did you um, forget how the car got in the river? How did you get out of this car? And, um, and she says, I just, kicked, I just kicked the door open, and I got out, and I'm like, that is in four feet of water, upside down, immersed in water. How did you kick the door open on that car? And um, we, went through, um, we went through a very emotional week this week. I'm going to let her tell her story about it a little bit. But um, Thursday night, I was, I was just praying with God, and he reminded me of a time about three years ago where um, he had just asked me to surrender my kids to him. And um, I remember being with Tony one time and saying, but, but these are my kids, okay? Like, I'm mom, I don't surrender my kids to anybody. And, and him saying, God can protect your kids a lot more than you can. And this is the God of the universe, and can you trust him with your children? And, um, and it took a little bit, but I finally said, okay, God, I'll, I'll trust you with my kids, but you've got to protect them, okay? <laughs> like, you've got to protect my kids. And um, the Holy Spirit um, just came to me Thursday night while I wasn't sleeping. And he said, I was there. I helped her out of that car. I helped her to safety, even if she doesn't realize it. Go ahead and put the next slide up for me. Um, I don't know how she got out that door. Okay, there, there's no handle. There's no nothing. It's bent in. I have no explanation on how she got out of this car other than the love of Christ and the hand of Jesus upon her helping her out um, and so um, you know surrendering our kids to God is probably one of the hardest things that we'll ever have to do um, but thankfully um, God was there and God God saved her because of our faithfulness to him so after the accident, I ended up going to two hospitals, and after about two CT scans and an x-ray, they said that I had no broken bones, no internal bleeding, and I walked away with this with a hyphema, a rare trauma to the eye. <laughs> and, the, and the cool thing was that was that when we first got to the emergency room, they actually put her in like a pre-surgery status and they had transferred us to a different hospital thinking they were gonna to have to do surgery on her eye. I had um, sent an email out to um, some of the, the members here, and um, as the day went on and as those prayers continued, she continued to get downgraded in severity of her symptoms. And um, it was just, just a miraculous day about just surrendering and, and allowing God to be in, in control. So um, thank you for all your prayers. and. Um, Jesus really does perform miracles, because <laughs> that's a miracle. <laughs> that's awesome. 
why don't we stand? Let's continue to worship. We're going to go back to that last song, and we're just going to start from the beginning. Let's just do it, guys. Let's worship. God, you're so worthy.
Good morning, everyone. I am Pam Pendleton, and I lead our children's ministry here at New Hope. I would like to welcome everyone. I would like to welcome our first-time guests. If you are a first-time guest today, there is a connection card that is located in the seat back in front of you. You can complete that and drop it in the basket over at the gathering place in the, at the information table. Just let us know how you found us today. And <clears throat> excuse me. And um, we have a gift over there of worship music downloads, and we won't send you a bunch of information. We just want you to let us know how you connected with us. If you are watching online today, welcome. We are glad that you joined us. And if you need to connect with us in any way, you can connect with us at newhopevineyard.org slash connect. Let us know how we can help you. Two Sundays ago, we passed out a booklet called How We Got the Bible as a resource relating to Tony's sermon. If you did not get one, we have more. See the greeter at the worship center door on your way out today to get your copy. Next week, August 8th, is Church in the Yard. Hopefully the weather cooperates. Um, if you have a lawn chair or a pop-up tent or an umbrella, bring that with you. The church will provide the burgers and the hot dogs and brats. If your last name begins with A through M, bring a dessert to share. If your last name begins with N through Z, please bring a salad or a vegetable. If um, we can all pray over our tithes and offerings, we have the box at the door that you can put those envelopes in. Um, just join me as we pray over those. Heavenly Father, we just thank you. We thank you for your protection. We thank you for your guidance. Lord, we just ask that you lead us to Utilize the blessings and the tithes that we offer to further your kingdom, your name, so everyone knows you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Kids, follow me out the door. Hey, how you doing? Woo! Good morning, everybody. All right. Have an awesome time, kiddos. And Pam. Pray for Pam. Hard. All right. What a, what a blessing uh, our kids are to our community, right? So uh, uh, anyway, uh, we are in the middle of this Jesus 101 series, getting back to the basics of the Bible and, and our Christian life and, and uh, what we're doing as believers in God. And today we are going to continue with the eighth phase of Jesus 101, and we call it Supernatural. 101. We're talking about the supernatural and the divine. And last week, we talked about what's the difference between supernatural and divine. We talked about uh, angels and, uh, and heavenly things. And we dispelled a lot of myths about angels. You know, they're not cute, fat little babies with wings and harps. I hate to break that to you. But uh, if you didn't get a chance to, to listen to that, it is still available online on our Facebook or YouTube. And after service, uh, Jan came up to me and said, hey, I, I have kind of a cool story I'd, I'd like to share. So Jan, come on up and, and share that with us before we di start digging deep. Okay, for those who don't know me, my name is Jan. And I have, uh, my daughter, Jamie, um, died of glioblastoma, which is brain cancer, in February, on February the 15th. And as a mom, you know, you, you just worry about your children. You're, you're concerned. You want them to be fine, you know. So um, I went to see Jamie, and I'm praying over her and anointing her and asking her, do you, you believe in Jesus? You, do you know where you're going? Yes, Mom. Yes, Mom. Okay. So anyhow, we, her husband uh, allowed us all to go. He took care of us all. To, we got to go home to Hawaii because she didn't want to die in her home because her children are going to live there, and she just didn't think that was good. So we all went to Hawaii, and we're in Hawaii, and um, I've asked her, several times. Do you know where you're going? You believe in Jesus? <laughs> it's like, Mom, yes. Anyway, so, you know, for my own comfort, I just want to know that I know that when I go to heaven, she's going to be there. 
And so um, I'm in bed one night. Well, we're all in this condo. It was beautiful. But, and everybody has their own little room. So I'm in my bedroom and um, laying in bed, and there was a knock at the door. And um, I said, yes. And then the, said, Janice. And I thought, oh, that must be my son-in-law. He's about the only one that calls me Janice. And I said, come in. And this person who was between six and seven feet tall was carrying a kind of a limp body and walks through the door, all the way through the door, and just stands there and looks at me. And I'm like, OK, I, I, I feel comforted. And then my daughter died the next day. So I know. She is there waiting for me. And that angel was a big, strong, masculine angel. No little Cupid with wings. <laughs> OK, thank you. Thank you, Jan. Wow. Wow. God still sends his angels to guard over us. I love that. Whew, I got like, I don't know about y'all, but I got like the chill bumps on that one. Well, thank you so much. And thank, thank you, Lori, for sharing. I mean, that just, yeah, so. God is good. Our culture and many centuries of art and literature have distorted biblical truth about heaven and hell, angels, demons, satans, even, even God. And it's good to have testimonies of, of angels and the hand of God on people today to really define the truth of the scriptures for us in a very real way. Because I don't know about you, but I, I open up my Bible and it's a wonderful, living, breathing document that I read and I enjoy. But to hear people who've experienced these things, and when you've experienced them yourself, it just is like, wow. It's like such a, a breath of, of fresh air and, uh, and that truth is good. So today, we're going to continue our supernatural series with evil beings, Satan and demons. And uh, we're going to talk about this because it's in the Bible, okay? And I will tell you this right now, that over these last couple weeks as I've been, well, actually, last couple months as I've been preparing this, but, but especially these last couple weeks as we, we've been working on this series of angels and demons and heaven and hell and Satan, uh, man, I've been getting my butt kicked, and the devil does not like when the truth about him is exposed. He does not like to be exposed as a liar. He doesn't like to be uh, exposed as a thief or a deceiver. He wants you to think he's your buddy, and those little whispers you get from him are okay, but they're not. And so when the truth comes out, he doesn't like that. And he has just been, thankfully, I, I, I had the, our, our ladies on Thursday morning were having their prayer meeting, and they prayed over me and just... Some cool stuff was happening. So we're going to just move forward uh, knowing that God is over this place. All righty, good. And so when we talk about evil beings and this, this idea of Satan and, and, and uh, demons and that, uh, the question that comes up is, you know, do you really believe in, in devils and, and demons? And when most people ask that, they're thinking of the, the Hollywood devil and demons, right? The, the little short chubby guys with the glowing eyes and fangs and pitchforks that, that get you in the night. And, uh, and my answer is always yes. Yes, I do believe them. Because while the Bible does not go into any of these topics at great length, they are still part of the biblical narrative. And the Bible is true, and the Bible is real, and so are demons. And unfortunately, so is the enemy, Satan. And hell is real also. In, uh, in his book, 40 Questions About Angels, Demons, and Spiritual Warfare, John Kilhuli writes this. This is important because a biblical account of spiritual beings will help us ward off unbiblical accounts, such as those offered by occult spiritualism, false religions, and popular culture. Speculations about such matters can be held in check by a firmer grasp of what the Bible teaches about these things. Okay, because I don't know about you, but when I turn on my TV or you open up a, a book or magazine, you get inundated with a lot of these things of the world. And that's why we have to open up our Bible and really get into that and take some time to pray to get back to the truth. So let's just lift this time in prayer. Father God, we just, uh, first of all, thank you for being our God.
We glorify you because you are King of kings and Lord of lords. You are the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And we love you, God. You are worthy of our praise, you who sits on the throne. And so we worship you, we come before you, Lord. And, and as we talk about these things that, that are far apart from you, Lord God, that you would protect our hearts and that you bring the truth of your gospel to light so we know how to guard ourselves, guard our children, guard our, our families against such things. And you know what? When it comes down to it, to pick up our sword and fight when needed. Oh, Lord God, speak to us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Woo. Come on now. Demons, let's start there. Let's start with demons. Since we talked about angels last week, and angels are no more than, uh, or demons are no more than fallen angels, we're going to start here with demons. And last week we, we used a word here, angelology, which is the study of angels, including fallen angels or, or demons. And, and so is it important to know about? Yeah, because this is in the Bible. Okay, we see angels in the Bible and we see demons in the Bible. There's also something, though, called demonology, which is the study of demons alone, just demons. And, and so the question is, is it okay for believers to study demonology? And I'm going to give you uh, three types of demonology first, and that should answer the question. The first one is biblical demonology, which again we call angelology, okay? And this is a necessary part of whole biblical theology. If we're going to take the Bible as truth, and we're going to take it from truth from Genesis all the way to the Amen and Revelation, this is part of it, okay? And so the source material for this study of this type of demonology is the Bible and what it says about dark powers, period. Now, yes, we are quoting some books like that, that one by John Gahooly. There's an R.C. Sproul book I recommend called Unseen Realities and things like that. But the point is, when they're writing these books, they always go back to Scripture. Okay. The second one is occultic demonology. And these are the studies that belong to the occult and cultic practices, speculations, and witchcraft of various kinds. The source material for this type of study comes from a mixture of folk beliefs, syncretic religious ideologies, demonic inspiration, and anecdotal commentary. And if I don't have to tell you yet, this is the type of demonology that should not be studied by Christians or really anyone. This is the stay away thing. The third type, though, is called historic or sociological Demonology, and it's a study of what a people or a society believes about demons, spiritual beings, rituals, things like that, okay? And this is a type of study, is a significant part of cultural analysis, can be important to historians and a sociologist, as well as missionaries and evangelists. Think about it, if you're a missionary and evangelist, you're going in to a, another culture where they believe in these things. They believe in the dark spirits, maybe even worship them. You should probably know about them in that context, right? Okay, so those are the three types of demonology. And, and so a lot of you are thinking, you know, wouldn't it be better just to not think about this kind of stuff and talk about like nice things like the love of Jesus and the warm hugs we get from God when we go to heaven? And, and while there is wisdom and caution, the Bible speaks about these things and our theology must reflect it, okay? Part of a healthy approach to Bible-based demonology, guys, is the recognition that the Bible doesn't really go into a lot of detail. It doesn't tell us a lot about demons. It doesn't tell us what they look like or what, you know, anything like that or any occultic practices because the Bible authors focus on what is true and what is good and what is righteous, not what is false or evil. The scriptures, as we read them, all 66 books are all about exalting God and pointing people to salvation through Jesus Christ. The Bible's not about demons, devils, or evil spirits. Yes, they're in there, but at best, they're bit players. They're the extras. You go higher off the street to make the story complete. The Bible it has one star and one star alone. His name is Jesus. All right. So what are demons? What, what, what is this? Uh, well, first of all, we get our word demon from the Greek word daimoniois, 
okay? And uh, simply and, and biblically stated, as we've said before, demons are fallen angels, okay? They're spiritual beings. They're non-corporeal. They don't have a body. They sinned after their creation, following the devil in his rebellion, and now war against God and his holy angels, and with respect to their nature, they are angelic beings, but they oppose heavenly angels in moral character. They're the opposite side of the spectrum. But remember this, because demons are fallen angels, they have the same limitation as heavenly angels that we talked about last week. Those limitations are that they are created beings. They are subject to God's rule. They're created. We are created God is not created. God is eternal. They are not omnipotent, omnipresent, or omniscient. If you're wondering what those three words mean, it means that only God is all-powerful, all-present, and all-knowing. They cannot create. They cannot grant wishes or perform miracles no matter what Hollywood tells us. In the New Testament... We see them sometimes called evil spirits or unclean spirits. Okay, so if you're reading along sometimes and you go, well, it didn't say demons, but it did say evil spirit. That's the same thing, or unclean spirit. <clears throat> In the Old Testament, they are often called syrim, syrim, and it literally translates as uh, goats or hairy ones. And this is because of, there were some false religions around that uh, area, the Assyrians and, and the Babylonians, the, the worshipers of Baal, and their, their uh, false gods a lot of times were made into the image of goats. And this is also why in modern history you always see the devil looks, has the goat horns or big horns or the cloven hooves and the goat feet. That's, that's why we get this from um, same word, but different meaning depending on, on their context, okay? What's their purpose, though? Because this is really what it's about. It doesn't matter what they look like. We don't need to know what they look like. We need to know what they're doing. And their main purpose, to do the devil's bidding. They're, they're, they're his army. And we'll talk about that a little bit later when we talk about Satan, who he is. But primarily, their purpose is temptation, confusion, and the destruction of God's people. That's you. That's why next week we're going to talk about spiritual warfare and what that means. Because he wants nothing more to confuse you, to tempt you into doing something you shouldn't be doing, to destroy you. In the Gospels, we see this played out as illness and affliction and oppression. We see Jesus heal people, deliver the demon oppressed, cast out evil spirits throughout all four books. And we'll talk more about their purpose when we talk about Satan because they kind of go hand in hand and we don't want to repeat everything twice. But uh, in his book, uh, in that same book, Angels, Demons, and Spiritual Warfare, John Gahuli writes this. Most presentations of demons occur within the gospel accounts of the New Testament. And if you do read that, you'll find that. Uh, in fact, the Bible says relatively little about demons. Chiefly, the important parts are that they exist and that they are intent to destroy God's people. Okay, we get wrapped up sometimes in, ooh, what do they look like? Where did they come from? How are they? Instead, and that's a great way for him to keep us busy on the wrong thing. <clears throat> We should be thinking of how do we defend ourselves against them. And the question that always comes up when you talk about demons or the devil is, can a Christian be possessed by demons? Okay, here we go. The, the short answer is no. The short answer is no, because upon our conversion, we are filled with the Holy Spirit. When you, are, when you are go and you come to Jesus and you give your life to him, he stakes a claim on you. You are his, and you are filled with the Holy Spirit. And when you fill the bucket, there's no room for anything else. Darkness cannot enter. Darkness cannot exist in the purity of the light of Christ, and there's nowhere really in the Bible that we see any believer of Christ being possessed. Now, this may be splitting hairs a little bit, We'll talk about that here. So where do we get this idea of demon possession? That's the key word here is 
possession. Well, when the Bible was translated into Latin around the fourth century, uh, the word I'm going to put a big word here, and I'm going to do my best here. Demonia zonomos, which is the Greek word meaning demonized. It means it's oppressed by a demon. They're outside picking at you, whispering at you, poking you, taunting you, tempting you. But they're not inside. But what, is, what happened in the fourth century when this was translated into Latin, it, it was poorly translated into Latin into possessio, which means to control. The problem is it also means to inhabit. It's a kind of a dual meaning. And so uh, a lot of times when it got translated into English, especially when the King James Bible came around in 1611, they translated that as demon possession rather than demon oppression. Does that make sense? It's a big difference. It's a big difference there. And so while Christ followers cannot be possessed by a demon, I will tell you this, they, will, they can definitely be demonized. They can be oppressed. They can be attacked. They can be picked at. They can be tempted. We can be tempted. After all, the purpose of the demon is to bring down the believer, isn't it? to separate us from God. And you know, the funny thing is if we look at that and we take it kind of a little further while we see spiritual gifts listed in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12. In fact, there's one called in 12, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 10 called the discerning between spirits or distinguishing between spirits of good and evil. Uh, there are no spiritual gifts of exorcism or casting out. And don't you think if, if demon possession was such a big deal to believers that God would provide a gift that would help us remove it, a tool that we could use? The word, uh, now there, there are times where Jesus casts out demons, okay? Understand that the word uh, used there in the gospel is demonize or ha demonize or ela demonize, which means either they're demonized or oppressed or uh, they have a demon with them. Also understand that these people are, have not met Jesus yet. They've not met Jesus. They, they're not what we would call Christians or believers in Jesus. They've not repented of their sin. Uh, and so uh, that is an open door for Satan to get in or his demons to have their way. And we need to look in, because sometimes, like in Luke 10, Jesus' disciples are empowered to cast out demons and that is still true today. We, you are empowered by the Holy Spirit to cast out demons, to fight demons. We don't go hunt them down. We don't go looking to pick a fight. And, and there's enough guys on YouTube and, and, and on the internet right now It's like, oh yeah, let's go get us some demons. No. No, trust me. Here's the thing. Our goal as Christians is always first to spread the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you do that, I promise the fight will come to you. You don't have to go looking. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> so in, in short, in summary, uh, demons are real beings who oppose the people and purposes of God. They promote false doctrine, false teachings, and the downfall of humanity. Not to be messed with. Not good things. So let's look at Satan. If that's Satan, call and tell him, come back later. We're not at him yet. <laughs> John, I'm kind of stuck here. I don't know if you can click on that one that says Satan for me, but he's not happy about this, I guess. There we go. Satan. Now, before we go too far on this, I want to explain one thing, that the enemy, Satan, is in no way comparable to God or Jesus. No way. Not even close. They're not in the same league. There was a, a meme that's gone around for years and years. It's kind of a, they've made posters out of stuff. Maybe you've seen it. It's Jesus arm wrestling with the devil. Right? And I was going to put it up here, but it is copyright, so I don't want to steal anybody's stuff. You got Jesus and the devil just, just locked in arm wrestling. But the problem is it shows them the same size, the same level, the same dimension, and they're not even close. To be more appropriate, it would have to look like Jesus would look like the Incredible Hulk and the devil would look like a three-year-old little girl. <laughs> or boy. Boy. 
could be Wonder Woman too instead of Incredible Hulk, if that's okay. But the point is, there, it's like putting your five-year-old grandchild who plays peewee football on the offensive line with the Steelers. Man, that's a bad example. Let's try a better team. <laughs> right? But they're not in the same league, and we need to understand that, guys. They're not even close. Satan, again, is a fallen angel. He is a created being. He's not eternal. And if we read Psalm 8, we know that angels are created just a little higher than men. So basically, we are here. The devil's here. And God's way up here. His ways are higher than our ways. And his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And the devil's way down here. Because of that, he is subject to to God's rule. He is not a God, not even a small g God. He's not like angels. He's not omnipotent, omnipresent, or omniscient, and he cannot create. He cannot grant wishes or perform miraculous acts. But he is real. He is real. In fact, through the Gospels, Jesus talks about him several times. I'll put some references up here if you want to write them down or, and, and look them up later. But these are five different instances where, where Jesus names him by name, either Satan or the devil, speaking very frankly about him. So we know he's real. We know he's real. All right. Whew, I got all worked up. I lost my place. So who is Satan? Who is this guy? Well, again, going back to the first time we see him in the Hebrew, uh, he's called Hasatan. Hasatan. It means the adversary. It's not a proper name. It's not a name at all. It, it's a word. It means the, it's a title. Hey, he's the adversary. He's Hasatan. In fact, in the, in the Hebrew, it's always written as Hasatan, the adversary, the Satan. He's never just called Satan. Okay? Now, as, as it happens sometimes, there, there's a word called etymology. It's, it's the study of where words come from and, that, and the, the evolution of words. And, and this word eventually evolved to become a proper name that even Jesus himself calls uh, Satan. So he's also called the devil. And this goes to the Greek, diabolos. And diabolos in Greek simply means opposition. In fact, it's a, it's a legal term. It's, it's a term used in court. They are the opposition to the case. Uh, the devil is always in opposition with God's people. He will fight us at every turn. So let's look at what we know or think we know about the devil. Because we, we busted a lot of myths last week about angels and heaven. So let's look at what we know about the devil. Well, most of what we know uh, or think we know comes either from Revelation but a lot of his backstory we get from Isaiah chapter 14 or Ezekiel 28. And so I'm going to just do a quick run through and then we'll take a look at it as we go along. And so here's what we know about Satan. Lucifer, the morning star, the light bringer, was created by God as a cherub. He was beautiful and more highly regarded than any other angel. And because of his pride, he rebelled. He was cast out of heaven millennia ago. He took a third of the angels with him. They now reside in hell, where they torment people in a sulfur-scented, fiery torture chamber. He also makes his way, accompanied by his minions, to earth occasionally to tempt and torment people as he awaits the time of final judgment. Sounds about right. The pictures on the Sistine Chapel tells us this is correct. But let's take a look at this, uh, this where we get this in Isaiah. It comes from Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 15. How you have fallen from heaven, morning star. Now, this is the new international version, but in the King James Version, it says, how you have fallen from heaven, Lucifer. Son of the dawn, you have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly on the utmost highs of Mount Zaphon. I will ascend, thank you, I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. He's talking about God there. But you, brought, but you are brought down to the realm of the dead, to the depths of the pit. 
Well, that makes sense, right? That certainly sounds what we've been told about Satan. The Bible's all about context, isn't it? Too many people over history have pulled one or two verses out of the context of the chapter or the book of the Bible to explain what they believe. Uh, so let's look at, at this piece by piece. Lucifer, the morning star, that was his angel name, right? Let's not, don't say yes, please. Okay. The word, the name Lucifer, never appears in the original Hebrew text of the Bible. There is no word in Hebrew, Lucifer. There is no name, Lucifer. In fact, it's Latin. Lucifer means light bearer, and it was a poor translation of the Hebrew word Hillel into Latin. So, again, back in that fourth century, when they were translating the Hebrew into the Latin, which we call the Latin Vulgate, uh, they mistranslated this word Hillel, and uh, they, they thought it meant light bearer or something like that, and they changed it uh, to Latin, which is Lucifer, which is, again, not a proper name. It's just a, a description of light bearer. Um, the word Hillel that we translate again, that we now translate as morning star, or sometimes day star or Lucifer, is, uh, is a, actually not even a name. It's a verb. The word Hillel means literally to, to cry out. It, it means to cry out in pain. It means to howl to cry out. And so if we look at that verse again, uh, it, uh, it would say, how you have fallen from the heaven, morning star or Lucifer, son of the dawn. But a better translation of the Hebrew would actually be, how you have fallen from heaven, period. Cry out, son of the dawn. Okay. Well, it still could be the devil we're talking about. We'll get there in just a little bit. Okay. But the thing is, we need to put it again in context. So let's go back a few verses. In Isaiah 14, 4, it says this, you will take up this taunt against the king of Babylon. It doesn't say you're going to take up this taunt against the devil or against Hasatan. It says you will take this up against the king of Babylon. And then the rest of the chapter as you read it is read like poetry. It's written in stanzas like, like a song or like poetry against the king of Babylon that was holding the Israelites captive, okay? And um, as we go through this, let's take a look at the next two verses. So we, we read what we usually were taught about Satan, but let's look at the next two verses. Those who see you stare at you. Well, he, again, we learned that Satan's non-corporeal. We can't stare at someone who's non-corporeal. They ponder your fate. Is this the man who shook the earth and made kingdoms tremble? The man who made the world a wilderness, who overthrew its city and who would not let his captives go home. It's not about a, a, a supernatural being. This is about a, an evil king who's doing horrible things to God's people. So when he was talking about the king of Babylon. Okay, so what does it mean that he put his throne higher than God's and all that? Well, if you, if you read anything in history about the kings of Babylon, Assyria, Egypt, their goal of the, the kings or the pharaohs were to become a god. They believed they were gods incarnate. So their idea was that they put their throne above God. But the Israelites knew who the real God was. And they're saying, whoa, whoa, you're putting your throne this high. You think you're greater than all the stars in the heaven, but you're not. And you'll be thrown down to earth. Okay? So that's kind of where we, we get that. In the same way, uh, in Ezekiel, I'm not going to read through Ezekiel for sake of time. Ezekiel 28 is very similar verses about this, this evil ruler. Um, again, cited as Satan's history. But if you read the second verse, again, putting things into context, it says this, say to the ruler of Tyre, da-da-da-da. Not say to Satan, not say to the devil. It's about the ruler of Tyre, the prince, actually, of, of Tyre. And he says this, you are a mere mortal and not a god. You're just a dude. Isaiah 14 is also where we get the idea that he was beautiful. He's called the son of the dawn, which was a terminology of endearment back then. We get the idea of a prideful rebellion as he supposedly, 
says he will ascend to the heavens. That he'll raise his throne and make himself like the most high. That's where we get these ideas. Now, here's a question. Did Satan take a third of the angels with him? Well, if we go to Revelation in tw uh, chapter 12, verses 3 through 4, it says this. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads, ten horns, seven crowns on its head, symbol of Satan. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. Now, throughout Hebrew poetry, uh, stars are often uh, references to angels. And so when they're talking about this vision, John, who was Jewish, would know exactly what he was talking about. So did he take a third? Yeah. How many is that? Is that a hundred? Is that a thousand? Is it a million? Is it a billion? We don't know. We do know in Hebrews, uh, the verse uh, 1222 tells us thousands upon thousands. And in the English Standard Version, it translates to innumerable angels were cast out with them. So did he take a third? Yes, he does. He has a third. Does Satan currently reside in hell? Maybe, maybe, because this is, this is a little ambiguous at best as we read through Scripture. Is this history that he was cast out then? Is it future that he'll be cast out soon? We know that in Job, he was having face-to-face -face conversations with God. So I'm not sure if he got like a day pass or what, but something happened. But what we do know from Scripture, Revelation 20 tells us that he will receive final judgment from God and be cast into a lake of fire. We know according to 2 Corinthians 4.4 4, that he is called the God of this world, the God of this age, through influence and, and opinions and goals and the whispering to people. And we'll, we'll talk more a little bit about him being in hell or not when we talk about hell in a couple weeks, okay? But here's the point I want to get to before we move on is oftentimes we get really wrapped up in this minutiae. We start dwelling on the little details, you know. It's like, man, I know I'm supposed to go, you know, defend myself against demons. There is going to be spiritual warfare. I wonder what they look like. I wonder what this is. I wonder what this is. And, and it's just a great rabbit trail that the enemy loves to take us down. And we put our shield down. We put our sword aside. And we start worrying about the trivia. And stop worrying that there's an enemy who's real and he's coming after us. So what do we, what do, we do about it? Because he has a purpose. We learned his purpose, right? Satan's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. And that, when he talks about that, that comes from a, a parable of the sheep. The shepherd is Christ, and, and we are his, his, his lambs. We are the, the sheep of his pasture. He comes to kill us and steal from us and destroy us. His goal is to tempt every believer into turning from God. He tried in Genesis 3 with Adam and Eve and succeeded. He tried again in Matthew 4 with Jesus, and he did not succeed. How arrogant must he be to actually try to tempt Jesus? He deceives people. He is called the father of lies. John 8, says, He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. That's all he can do. Those little whispers you hear are all lies. So what can we do about it? What can we do? Number one, don't fear him. We do not fear him. 2 Thessalonians 3 says this, The Lord is faithful, and he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. So we do not fear the evil one, but we do guard ourselves against him. We do guard ourselves. Be alert and sober-minded. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. That's his goal, to devour us. Our goal is to stay sober-minded and on guard. So we don't fear him. We guard ourselves against him, and then we resist him. How do you resist the devil? How do you resist the demon? You do it by surrendering yourself to God fully. Because when you're full of God, there can't be any, there's no room for anything else. James 4, 7 tells us, submit yourself then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. 
Later in Luke uh, 10, during Jesus' life, he says, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. What's going to harm us? Nothing with the authority of Christ. Here's a fun one. Don't blame him. It's not always his fault. Now, don't get me wrong. When evil happens, there's usually evil uh, at the root. He's there. One of his demons is there. But a lot of times we say, the devil made me do it. As an excuse when we've already learned that if we resist him, he'll flee. But it's a lot easier to sin and blame it on him than to go, I made a bad decision and I need to repent. So though he may tempt us, or one of his demons may tempt us, many times it's our desires, our poor decision that leads to sinful actions. James 1.14 says, Each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Number five, don't underestimate him. Do not underestimate him. He is cunning. He is deceitful. And again, he wants nothing more than to separate us from God. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen through 15. For Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. He doesn't come as a grotesque red guy that's easily identifiable. He doesn't have a t-shirt. I'm the devil. Right? He comes subtly and deceitfully, cunningly to us. He says, uh, then if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness, his demons come also the same way, but the end will be what their actions deserve. Go get him, God. So don't overestimate him. But the other thing that a lot of, or don't, I'm sorry, underestimate him, but also don't overestimate him. He's a created being. And he is submissive to our God. He is submitted, submissive to the spirit that lives within us. Not to us, but to the spirit that lives within us. He's not all-knowing. He doesn't know everything. He doesn't know everybody. He's not all-present. He's not like God that can be everywhere at once. He may be hanging out in Australia right now, having a shrimp on the barbie. We don't know, but he can't be everywhere at once. He probably doesn't even know your name. But I bet you one of his demons do. That's why he has to have demons. That's why he had to take a third of heaven with him, because he can't do it himself. So that's good news for us. He is not all-powerful. He is not a god, not even the small g god. We overcome him because the king of kings and the lord of lords dwells within us and protects us and guides us first john 4 4 says this you dear children i love the way it starts out you are dear children of god did you know that you dear children are from god and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world we can't do it by ourselves. We should never try to do it by ourselves. But the, the one who's in us is greater than anything else that could come against us. We know that. We rejoice in that. So don't fear him. Guard yourself against him. Resist him. Don't blame him. Don't underestimate him. Don't underestimate. Don't overestimate. Again, let me recommend four different books to you. Last week, I recommended three of these. Unseen Realities by R.C. Sproul. Forty uh, questions about angels, demons, spiritual warfare. The Invisible War, which we're going to be using a lot next week when we talk about spiritual war. Chip Ingram, great book. And Erasing Hell by um, Francis Chan. Really good books. Uh, feel free to look those up. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. I'm going to ask our prayer partners, our prayer team to get into place. If you need prayer today, make sure you get prayer today. Here's the thing. Demons are active, and they will mess with us. They will try to oppress us. They'll try to do whatever they can, and we need to knock them off. And sometimes we can't do that by ourselves. That's why we have people pray for us. That's why I went from my office over to where the ladies were praying and said, give me some, because I need prayer. But just to sum up real quick, Satan and his demons are real. They're part of the biblical narrative, okay? So we should know about them. We should know about their schemes to defeat us. 
we must educate ourselves about how to defend against their attacks, which again is why next week we're talking about spiritual warfare. But again, remember this, guys. It's nothing to be feared. When it comes down to it, even reading through the Bible, these evil beings, these, these fallen angels, Satan, the demons, are bit players, barely a footnote in God's plan for humanity. The Bible writers are writing about truth and righteousness, that God loves us and desires nothing more than to have a relationship with us. And if, if you don't have that relationship, I want to encourage you to come up and get prayer today and receive that. And if you're watching from home, please fill out that, that newhopevineyard.org slash connect and let us know. We'll give you a call and pray with you. We want you also to receive that gift of the Holy Spirit living within you. The primary purpose of Scripture is where our focus should always be. And our focus should always stay on Christ and his love for us and giving glory to God. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are good and greatly to be praised. We thank you, Lord, that, that you and you alone rule, that your ways are higher than our ways, Lord God, and they are higher uh, than the ways of any created being, including Satan and his demons. We thank you, Lord, that you have provided the Holy Spirit that infills us and guards us and protects us against him. We thank you, Lord, that through the name of Jesus, we have been given authority to cast out demons, to fight demons and the devil and the schemes that they bring against us. We love you, God, and we give you all the glory. You, you are a good, good father. And we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to finish with uh, one more song. Oh,
Iglesia. 